Awesome. So this week, I love doing these sessions with you guys because it's a way to dive deep into one topic um, and hopefully like expose some myths, uh, reveal some truths, and maybe uh, help you make better decisions when you shop in the supermarket and cook at home. So today's topics, I didn't know if you got this from the little Instagram post last night, um, but today we're going to be talking about fats and oils, the good, the bad, and the delicious. So um, I'm going to focus on, you know, the particular areas where I think uh, that I think are the most important. So I'm not going to be covering things that hopefully you already know a lot about. So why do we want to talk about this? Um, I actually learned a lot just researching for this little session, which was great for me. I always I love it when that happens. Um, it actually turns out that if you get the right fats and the right balance, it impacts, um, let's see, muscle building, fat loss, and blood sugar regulation in your bloodstream. So it's kind of important, right? So we all care about that. Like we're all fine tuning. We go to the gym because we want to see certain results um, in our physique. We want to get stronger. We want to build muscle. We want to become more lean. Uh, we always want to control our blood sugar. So apparently, you know, balancing the right fats in the right way is going to impact all of those things. So that's exciting. So I'm going to talk to you about this a little bit more, but before we get started, I want to do a little bit of a true false, true false question uh, session. Um, it's only the three of us, so we can just do this with your microphones unmuted, no problem. But the first question is, extra virgin olive oil is the healthiest oil for pan frying foods. What do you guys think? No. Yeah, well, my dad that's says what no. we use. <laughs> Um, I, I just figured no, because we would all say yes, so I figured I'd say no. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a little bit of a use, trick question. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh -huh. I figured. So I don't know. We use avocado oil sometimes. Great. Um, and then we'll talk about olive it. oil. Those are the two in our house, avocado and olive oil for regular use. Okay, good. So the reason that this is a little bit tricky is because of the word fry. So fry tends to imply a higher heat, uh, which is not olive oil's best and greatest use, but olive oil is a great food and it should be in your house and used for light saute or topping foods. Avocado oil is uh, even a little bit better than olive oil in terms of absorbing heat. But um, we don't ever want to smoke our oil and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, the second question, omega-3 supplements are good for your heart. True. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be the class nerd and just, you know, okay. keep answering. <laughs> <laughs> There's only three of us, so I definitely want you to answer. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be standing here talking to myself. <laughs> True. Okay. Ariel, any ideas? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is great. Very revealing. It's actually false. Um, You're right. So fall so far, okay? Um, I would say that we don't know enough yet. Um, a, we actually uh, did a study, we, people other than me, <laughs> did a study including 80,000 patients, which is a pretty big study, and they actually found that there is no link between uh, omega-3 supplements or fish oil supplements and heart disease. So, um, However, it's important to know that fish oil supplements could have other benefits. So if you're taking them, I'm not telling you to stop taking them. They're not harm harmful in any way. And in fact, there's more and more research being done of the impact on um, fish oil supplements and the brain, okay, and delaying things like uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. So uh, there could be a tremendous amount of benefit there, but right now there's no, really no proof that it helps in fighting heart disease. Okay, the third question, coconut oil is high in saturated fat and so will raise my risk of heart disease. Coconut oil, no. controversial. Oh no, false. Mm. Okay, <laughs> good job. Uh, it's kind of true and false in a weird way. Coconut oil is 95% saturated fat and we all hear how bad saturated fat is for your arteries. But it's a different kind of saturated fat. It's a medium chain triglyceride, uh, the saturated fats that you find in animal food are long chain. They're actually digested differently. Um, and this is the crucial difference that a lot of people miss when you read about bloggers talking about, you know, uh, coconut oil. So it's, it's actually absorbed into the system differently. And in tests, it has been shown to raise both good and bad cholesterol, but not in a harmful way and probably in a beneficial way. And it has other benefits um, because it's a plant food. It has um, antioxidants and other benefits. 
uh, to using it. Um, the really important difference for me is coconut oil can be found in a healthy format. So while a lot of oils are processed in really negative bad ways, coconut oil you can usually find, and we're going to talk about it more later, um, in a virgin form that's cold pressed. So we're going to talk about that. And that's one of the reasons why I like to use it. It has a higher smoke point than olive oil and avocado oil. So the fourth one, animal products do not have healthy omega-3 oils. Say that again, please. Animal products do not have healthy omega-3 oils. I, think I don't know. I'd be guessing. I mean, I don't know. I'd be totally guessing. Anybody want to guess? I think you're yes. You're nodding. So you think it's true? Or are you think thinking of them? You think they do have them. Okay, so you're right. Um, the problem is that a lot of farm animals are raised on food that isn't natural to their diet, and they're eating the byproduct of corn oil mm -hmm. um, and soybean oil production. Yeah. Those oils have a bad ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, which we're going to talk more about. And so the meat in those animals has a bad ratio, and when we eat it, we take on that bad sure. ratio. So it's a problem with the food supply. However, if you eat animals that eat grass and other natural foods, including chickens that are raised to pasture, you know, the farmers that come to the gym yes. every now and then, they raise chickens that way. Um, also the eggs that come from those chickens, those have healthy omega-3s in the right, in the proper balance. And the, uh, nature is amazing, isn't it? When you screw with it, you screw it up. When you let it be, it works itself out. Okay, so a few nutrition concepts and then we'll get onto food. But um, types of fats, you hear people talking about all the time, the monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and saturated fats. I'm not going to spend any time talking about saturated fats because we've heard enough about that. Um, the polyunsaturated fats, that's where all the interesting stuff is because that's where the um, essential fatty acids are. Those are the omega-3s and omega-6s, and they're essential because you have to eat them to, to get them in your body. We cannot we cannot make those fats. We can make other kinds of fats, but we cannot make essential fatty acid, omega-6 uh, omega and omega-3s. So it's important to know that you need both, but you need them in the right balance. So the proper 6 to 3 ratio, we think, we don't know 100%, is about 4 to 1, but it can be anywhere from 4 to 1 to 1 to 1. We actually know a little bit about the uh, ratio of uh, food that was taken in by um, humans like pre-industrial age, but like thousands of years ago, okay? And some of their ratios were like one to one or even less than that. So um, these are numbers. Numbers are boring. I don't want to talk about it too much, but I just want you to remember that the fact that it has to be in the right ratio because I'm going to show you oils that are on the market that are not in the right ratio, okay? So um, again, remember that the essential fatty acids are the one that affect body composition and even mental health. So it's really important to get them and to get them in the right balance. It also can impact your physical performance in the gym because when you get them in the right balance, you have the ability to burn stored fat more efficiently and you can use it for energy when you're working out. So we will all want to get better at that, right? Um, the fact that you can have better energy and be using the fat that's stored in your body, I think has to be something that's interesting to everybody. Um, can you guys still see me? Yeah, okay. Um, what else do I want to say? So we mentioned, uh, you know, the, the six to three ratio. Um, the American diet, the typical American diet is anywhere from 10 to one to 40 to one. So it's really in bad shape. So why is it that way? We already mentioned one reason. It's the, um, the animal products that are in the food supply. Um, all of these animals are eating foods that have a poor six to three ratio. And so we're ingesting it and taking it into our body. So our ratios are poor. Um, the second reason is that oils have been introduced into the food supply in a really crazy way. Um, soybean oil is a really big, um, and corn oil are two really big uh, parts of the United States economy. It's a big part of the farming industry. It's a huge export for us. And I actually have a link to share with you in a little while. Um, I think it came from the St. Louis Fed, which is the region where corn and soybeans are grown. Um, and they talk about the production and the size of the production and the export. I think Brazil is the second largest producer and maybe the first exporter and we're the, the second exporter to the world of these products. So it's used for fuel, um, it's used for animal food and it's used to supplement you know, human food. 
So um, these oils, soybean oils and um, corn oils, they have really poor ratios. So let me see if I can share my screen with you now. I just want to show you, I'm not going to do a lot of this, but I just want to show you a few pictures just to bring it all home. So this is <laughs> the grocery store oil, uh, oil aisle. So how confusing is all of that? So here are omega-6 to omega-3 ratios of a few different kinds of oils. Deepak, hello, when did you come in? <laughs> hey Leah, welcome back. Uh, Linda put her mask on and uh, left her car, so we think she's in the store right now. Or maybe the post office, I think she had mail. <laughs> All right, so this slide, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So I want to point out the ratios. We already mentioned, for those of you who didn't hear it, the proper ratio for the human diet, we think, is about 4 to 1 to 1 to 1, somewhere in that range, okay? The typical American diet is 10 to 1 to 40 to 1, so our omega-6 to omega-3 ratios are way out of whack partly because of uh, corn and soybean fed animals that are in the food supply and animal products, the milk, the eggs, the cheese, and partly because of the infiltration of these oils into the food supply in the supermarket. Um, so here I'm gonna point some of them out. So some of the arrows, not the first arrow, but the second arrow, the soybean oil, 6.75 to one, the safflower oil, 14 to one, corn oil, 57 to one, and sunflower oil, 71 to 1. Um, also down there is um, cottonseed oil, peanut oil, or, and palm oil are three more that you want to watch out for, okay? So um, two problems with these oils. One is this ratio is out of balance for us. Now the problem is not that we don't want omega-6s. The problem is that we're already getting so much of it in our diet that the balance is out of whack. So when we're eating, when we're choosing oils, when we're choosing foods to eat, we want to fix the balance by adding more omega-3 to our diet than we normally would. And the way to do that is to get the right oils um, and the right fats from the right animals. So we're talking fish, fatty fish, and we're talking grass-fed animals, eggs from pastured chickens and pastured chicken meat, okay? That's primarily the way to get it. You're gonna throw yourself more out of whack eating animals that eat corn and soy because they're on this list. And so their ratios are out of whack, okay? So um, I want to point out at the top the flaxseed oil. That's a great oil to have in your cabinet. You cannot cook with it, but it's great for making dressings and things like that. Now the second biggest problem with these oils is how they're processed, right? So things are actually a lot better than they used to be because some companies figured out that they can make a lot of money processing oils differently than they were. So there are different types of ways to process oils. Um, I'm going to go from worst to best, okay? Now, realize that on the price line, as you go from worst to best, the oil gets more expensive. And I do understand that. So you may want to pick something on the spectrum that's in the middle as opposed to shooting for the gold standard, but you might want to have some cold, you know, gold standard in your cabinet to use from time to time, okay? So this is the process. I just, I'm just going to read it to you from a piece of paper I have in front of me on how the poorest um, forms of oil are made. And that's this Safia or Safia pure sunflower oil that's on the right side of this picture. So listen to this. Rind, wash, or purge with a solvent like petroleum distillate, hexane, for example. Then flash off the solvent by heating. Now at this point, the solvent is still in the mix. So then you have to heat the oil solvent blend again to distill off the solvent. However, 25 parts per million left in the final product is still okay. Then it's refined in a process that's called RBD. RBD stands for refined, bleached, and deodorized. Okay? <laughs> then we're not done yet. We still have to degum it and winterize it. Okay, so then it goes through all of these processes, gets into a bottle, lands in your kitchen, and then you cook with it. So you heat it again. So what's left at this point? I'm not really sure. Certainly no nutritional value. Definitely not the healthy fats that we're looking for when we add oils to our diet, okay? Um, and it's possibly not even good for you. I mean, it could be unsafe. Plus, these are oils that are made with high omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, okay? So you're getting the picture? <laughs> Now the benefit of these oils is they can usually be cooked um, at a very high heat and it's the reason that 
It's the only thing that restaurants use to cook, okay? So if you're eating fried food in a restaurant, you are getting this one on the right, trust me. And it's probably been heated more than once. So I'm not painting a pretty picture for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's, that's the fact. On the left is expeller pressed refined, which is one level up, okay? So expeller pressed, they don't necessarily add heat to the process, but what they're doing is they're grinding um, and creating friction in a way that the temperature tends to rise. If something is called expeller pressed, we don't exactly know, but it's better definitely um, than the solvent ex extracted oil, okay? So it's one step up. And you can see we've got sunflower oil and safflower oil, and I'm pretty sure seven, eight, 10 years ago, you could not find this, maybe even four or five years ago. You can only find the type on the right, okay? Next slide, peanut oil, vegetable oil. We actually have peanut oil in our house. We use it once a year to deep fry a turkey. Other than that, it doesn't touch. And the only reason is because we need like two gallons of it and it needs to go to 350 degrees um, and I, or close to 400 degrees. And we really don't wanna use an oil that uh, is gonna burn. That's the oil on the right the planters and the Crisco. The Crisco is actually vegetable oil, which I didn't mention yet, but it's a blend of these oils. So same thing, stay away from it. On the left is the Spectrum brand. They've come a long way to doing better processes of all of these oils. So you can find Spectrum peanut oil. So if you need a peanut oil, this is a better one to use, okay? Um, still, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is out, but at least it's processed more safely. Okay. And then I promised the gold standard, um, Linda isn't here anymore, but she mentioned avocado oil as an oil that she uses. Um, I actually took that bottle off the shelf and brought it home with me. <laughs> so um, avocado oil is processed in a similar way to olive oil and coconut oil, which is the reason that I like those three oils. Unrefined and cold extracted, this is the gold standard. Now, I don't know if you can um, see the label on the right where I've circled, it actually says unrefined and cold extracted on the label. Just to go back a step, what foods have processed oils added in them? Here's a list that commonly have soybean oil in them. Um, and then on the right, that commonly have corn oil. So I, I want you guys to get good at reading labels closely and look for it and you will start to see how much it has infiltrated our food supply. Now, I'm not saying there uh, are mean people out there that are trying to make us sick. It's that we have all this oil, we're making all this oil, we grow all this corn and soybean in this country, and, we're, and it's very cheap for food producers to add it to our food to give it a be better mouthfeel and a better consistency, okay? Um, the one that surprised me was the fast food hamburger patties um, and taco meat. If you're going to probably a chain restaurant, they're adding these oils probably, I'm guessing, to make it cheaper to produce and also improve the mouthfeel. Okay, so that's it for slides. So um, I'm going to start wrapping it up, but I just wanted to show you some of the oils I have in my house. So this is one we didn't discuss. This is like a regular olive oil. It's not extra virgin, so you can cook a little bit hotter with this one. Um, this is an olive oil spray. And you can see right here, I don't know if you can read it, but it says first cold pressed. So there's the word cold. When you see the cold, that's a good thing, okay? That's what you're looking for. And my coconut oil says on the back, it's too small for you guys to read, but cold pressed, unrefined, virgin, organic coconut oil. That's what we want, right? Now, I know a lot of people don't like the flavor of coconut, but I find I don't taste the coconut once it's heated. Like I smell it when it first hits the pan and then it dissipates for me. So it doesn't bother me at all. At all. Um, and I like the sprays because you can use less, right, when you're cooking. That's it. Here's the avocado oil that I purchased yesterday. So I'm going to start using that. I'm excited about that. Okay, so on to food. The first thing that I'm going to make for you guys is guacamole. I have most of this stuff pretty much prepared because it needs to be quick. And the reason I wanted to do guacamole is because it's made with avocados, which have healthy fats, right? And that's what we've been talking about. So I'm gonna give you guys all these recipes. But it's as simple as combining these ingredients. I don't know how comfortable you are working with avocados, but you just basically cut it around the side. Um, that is a nice looking avocado. I've been ripening it for a couple of days now. I'm very proud of this avocado. I'm just gonna... 
little tricky to get the pit out sometimes. I don't do it in my hand like this, but I will strike the pit with the knife and then just twist it out, okay? Do you guys like to make or use avocados in cooking? Yeah? Okay. So this is a pretty ripe avocado. So you're just going to scoop it out. Some people like their avocado mushy. Some people like it chunky. It's up to you. I'm going to make it a little bit mushy. I'm just, as you guys can tell, I'm not a chef. I don't do this for a living. I'm just a home cook. So I'm just going through the process of mashing up this avocado in the bowl. And then I'm going to keep adding ingredients. The next one is a medium tomato chopped, which you see right here. Then the juice of two limes. So here are the tomatoes. And I have to admit, I forgot to juice the limes. So here's me pretend putting lime juice into my guacamole. Uh, but that will go in when I get off this call. And then the finely chopped red onions. I actually don't have red onions in the house, but I was lucky enough to have a shallot, so I used that. That's an awesome substitution. And then you have your spices. A little bit of, it's a quarter of a teaspoon of ground cumin. Obviously, adjust these spices to fit your taste buds. A little bit of salt. Salt is a topic for another day. A little bit of ground pepper. And that's pretty much it. Now I'm serving mine. A little bit messy, but you guys have all seen guacamole. Now mine is chunky, my tomatoes are bigger, because that's the way I like it, but you obviously can make this any consistency that you like. And then I'm serving mine with, boo, celery and carrots, kids are gonna hate it. <laughs> but I also have corn chips. So that's the guacamole. The next kind of fun thing that I wanted to show you was my tortilla press. Now you can do this with a plate, uh, the bottom of a sauce or the bottom of a plate, or you can do it with like a frying pan. Um, so here's my tortilla press. This just makes it more fun because it's a gadget. <laughs> I like gadgets. And I may, you have to make um, tortillas with masa harina. So is, any, is anybody familiar with this? You are, Leo. So this is what it, my version looks like. Okay, masa harina is basically cornmeal, but it's just treated with lime water, which is actually not limes, but something else. Um, two cups of this, a cup and a half of water. Literally, those two ingredients plus a little bit of salt. You mix it with your hands. It looks like this. I already made some balls. So I use the scooper to make the balls because then I get about the same size, but you want it to be about a ping pong size, ping pong ball size. And then you can put it inside your press. It's so cool, I love doing this. And simply squeeze. Okay. So simple. And it comes out looking like this. And then all you need to do is throw it into a pan, no oil. I made one here. See my pan? <laughs> and I actually have some that I already made. So um, I have like three tortillas in here. I plan on making more for lunch because my kids are going to be invading the kitchen very soon. So onto this is going to go my taco filling. So let me show you the taco filling. You're going to come with me. Come with me up into my stove. I feel like Julia Child. All right, there it is. Turkey meat, beans, poblano peppers. I started with a little olive oil. Can you guys see that? Olive oil and onions. I need to reheat it. It's starting to look a little cold. Um, and some tomato sauce. I always keep um, a low sugar tomato sauce in a jar in my house because um, even though I'm of Italian descent, I don't like to make tomato sauce all the time, I figure. <laughs> So that is going to go pretty simple tacos, right? Onto my taco shell. Now I have two variations of this. I'm going to show you real quick. Because I have to make it more fun. 
but this is your basic turkey taco. So the turkey obviously has less saturated fat in it, so it's going to be a little bit healthier for you than a beef taco. And I find that once you put cumin and you know um, taco seasoning in it, talk about those for a second. Chili powder is an important one. Paprika. Um, once you put these things in it, you kind of don't um, really know the difference for me anyway between turkey and beef. It's kind of the same. So you can do anything you want with toppings, right? Um, these are why, you know, this type of food is like a nutritionist dream because you can literally go into the fridge and find out whatever vegetables you have there. I've got chopped, this is cilantro. I've got chopped spinach. So I have gotten so used to keeping the spinach in my house that I actually don't even buy lettuce anymore. So I wasn't a big spinach fan before. Um, then I discovered baby spinach and it's just a lot more tender and less bitter for me. So I use this as a regular substitution for lettuce on top of whatever. And it just has more nutrition, okay? The darker green leaf. So there is that. I have some chopped up um, grape tomatoes, which I love. Some cheese. A little bit of cheddar cheese is okay. And then I substitute Greek yogurt for sour cream. Trust me, nobody will know the difference. Um, so try that. Two quick substitutions I have for the turkey meat, and this is the reason I really love it, is because I can make it for everybody in the house. I have a lot of friends whose, girl, whose daughters have become vegan all of a sudden. They eat meat in the whole of their lives and now they reject it. So obviously take the turkey meat out and you've got at least vegetarian. You won't want the Greek yogurt out on it, obviously. I also roasted, this is halibut. Now I put the same taco seasoning on top of this that I used on the turkey. I just put it in an oven, um, like 350 for about 25 minutes. Um, this can be chopped very easily, cut into pieces, like two to three ounce pieces, and put on top of the taco shell, and then you put the toppings on top of it. You can add beans to that as well. And then the other variation is shrimp, which is my favorite also cooked with the same taco seasoning that I used for the <clears throat> turkey taco. So this can go onto your taco. So now in my house, we have four carnivores, but two of us prefer fish um, and the other two will eat anything. <clears throat> you see something in the chat window? <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, come on over, seriously, I have too much food now. Although my kids are gonna devour it, who am I kidding? Um, so that's it. I wanted to show you the Greek yogurt substitute for the sour cream because trust me, nobody's going to know the difference. I promise you, try it. I wanted to show you making your own corn tortillas. Super simple. This takes literally five minutes to do. And all of a sudden you feel like you're making something really special. But I did get the taco shells. And if you have to substitute these, um, anybody want to guess what the ingredients are? Lime's corn, which is the masa harina palm oil. Remember, palm oil was on that list, okay? So here it is in the food supply. And salt. Now, I didn't put any oil in mine, right? So I'm not really sure why you need oil in this, except to probably hold it together long term to keep them from cracking and to keep them moist. I used water. So that's the difference between buying it from the store and making it yourself, okay? That just eliminated this omega-6 fat or this excessive omega-6 fat because I still need them in my diet, just not so much. Um, all right, I want to wrap up because it's been half an hour and I don't want to keep you guys longer than that, but can I answer any questions? We talked a lot about the three different types of fats, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, how to add more omega-3 to your diet. Um, there we go. So this document has the recipes in it that I just <clears throat> gave you, plus maybe one more. Um, and it has a link at the beginning from the St. Louis Fed that talks about the soybean and corn oil market in this country. And that's all I got, guys. Thank you so much for coming. It was yeah, fun. Would you, you have any interest? Yesterday. We were just, we're making tacos tonight, but we already bought everything. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Enjoy them. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Is there any ability for you to deliver the tacos? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick it up. Stan will be standing in front of the door. I don't think so. I could do I could do curbside pickup. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll chat. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Bye.